Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Applied Biomechanics, a multifaceted approach to answering human movement questions with objective data. This is Martin Hess from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session today is sponsored by Noraxon USA and is the first of a series of webinars designed to survey biomechanics, starting with its core components of kinematics, kinetics, and neuromuscular activation, and progressing to their application within research and industry. Our speakers for this first webinar are Dr. John Cockroft, Managing Staff Scientist at the Human Motion Analysis Unit at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, and Mr. Coleman Bessert, an Applied Biomechanist at Naraxon USA. John and Coleman will review the basic principles of biomechanics and how the study of human movement has evolved over time. They will also highlight examples in applied kinematics, applied kinetics, and applied neuromuscular and motor control, and demonstrate how methodologies vary depending on the field of study or area of expertise. During session two, scheduled for February the 2nd, 2017, we will dive deeper into the principles introduced today in part one, discussing experimental design, data collection, as in how to collect data accurately and with confidence, and innovations for different application areas. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, Coleman and I are going to be presenting this webinar in a tag team format. Um, Coleman's expertise is in applied biomechanics, so he's going to be taking us through the practical parts of the webinar a bit later on. My background is in biomechanics research, so I'll be presenting the conceptual sections as well as the introduction. Please do note, as Martin said um, earlier, this webinar is the first in a series, so the main focus today is just for us to introduce a broad framework for diving into more detailed and advanced topics later on in the series. But uh, whether you're a biomechanics veteran or relatively new to biomechanics, whether you're a researcher or a clinician, trainer or coach, we really do hope you'll leave the webinar feeling inspired by the exciting developments in the field and, and to join us as we continue to dig deeper into the following webinars as well. So before we start, just a note on our terminology today. Uh, biomechanics is actually a massive field that can involve the study of any organism or its subsystems of any size and in any context. So today we, we're focusing really on the biomechanics of the human musculoskeletal system during functional activity. Secondly, for the sake of convenience, we'll also be treating electromography as a part of biomechanics, even though EMG is an electrophysiological measure and not a mechanical one. And again, EMG in its entirety is quite a broad field. Today we will be focusing purely on kinesiological EMG recorded using surface electrodes. Okay, so before we introduce some of the latest advancements in applied biomechanics, it's going to be useful for us to take a quick look throughout history at some of the previous major advancements that got us to where we are today. So throughout history, people have been fascinated by how the human body moves. However, in the pre-scientific era, two giants stand out for their pioneering work in advancing how we think about human movement today. The first is Aristotle, whose writings are some of the earliest records we have of investigations into the movement of objects and organisms. Aristotle's views on physical science shaped our understanding of the physics of motion for 2,000 years. However, um, during Aristotle's time, many phenomena still remained a mystery to the ancient Greeks. For example, why a rock would fall when you dropped it or continue flying forwards if you threw it. The second uh, giant of the pre-scientific era was Galen, a Roman physician who worked amongst the gladiators and studied, amongst other things, the role of skeletal muscles in movement. Galen's writings uh, on human anatomy and physiology were used for over a thousand years as the standard for medical education and practice. It's often said that hundreds of years after his death, his views were still so influential that if a human cadaver was found to have different anatomy to his model, that the fault was actually attributed to the cadaver. Um, however, 
Gallen had actually built his model of anatomy from dissecting apes rather than humans because he thought that they were similar enough to us. Of course, this led to some erroneous conclusions. But Aristotle and Gallen can be thought of as representing the two knowledge streams that eventually merged into what we know today as biomechanics. How did we advance from here? So the next wave of advancements were advancements in knowledge in the form of improvements to Aristotle's mechanics and Gallen's anatomy. During the Renaissance period in Europe, there was a renewed interest in the human body from both artists and physicians. People really wanted to look inside the human body to understand the shape of the muscles and the bones and how everything fits together. But since they didn't have the means to do this safely with living and moving people, this led to an increase in the systematic dissection of human cadavers. Dissection brought significant advances in our knowledge of anatomy, including our understanding of the musculoskeletal system, and from this time on, anatomy was really treated as an actual scientific discipline. During the Enlightenment period, uh, which followed the Renaissance, there was renewed interest in our ability to understand and express reality mathematically. People wanted to know what the physical laws are that govern how we move and how these apply in different contexts. So they developed the mathematical tools needed for quantifying motion, which we use routinely in biomechanics today without even thinking about it. For example, there were major developments in the formalization of analytical geometry, which gives us 3D coordinate systems and Euler angles for joint uh, motion descriptions, as well as Newtonian mechanics, which provides us with the equations describing the laws of motion and which give us insight into the effects of gravity on the body. But at this time, it was still impossible to measure these mechanical quantities of human movement and this hindered further progress. These two eras uh, were the birthplace of the scientific method and from this time on people really began to apply mathematical and anatomical knowledge to the analysis of human movement in a rigorous scientific way. So um, the problem with this was still that it would take another 200 years before scientists were able to analyze human movement using reliable experimental data. This brings us to the next wave of advancements, which was in the realm of technology and our capability to measure and digitize human movement. So the Industrial Revolution brought with it the first basic sensor technologies that were able to register the key quantities of motion in Newtonian mechanics. Um, people started to apply these sensor technologies to human movement analysis, and this resulted in the development of the first optical motion capture devices or cameras first transducers which could measure um, ground reaction forces and the first EMG type devices that could measure bioelectrical signals. But this created a new problem, a problem of time efficiency because by the time um, the first, the world's first gate analysis in three dimensions was performed in Germany in the 1890s, the measurement data took years to analyze mathematically using pen and paper methods. It just wasn't efficient or reliable to perform the calculus by hand. But after World War II, the digital revolution provided an exponential increase in our ability to do computation. Eventually, computers became available that were able to reliably store electromechanical sensor measurements and then quickly and automatically perform the complex mechanics calculations needed for analysis. Suddenly, it took just a few minutes to calculate and visualize analysis outcomes for a single movement test. In the second half of the last century, biomechanics became widely recognized as a field of study. Movement analysis labs were being established and measurement equipment began to be commercialized. But the barrier that remained was that experiments were still constrained to highly controlled lab settings and equipment was still quite bulky and expensive. And this really brings us to the modern day. It's really an exciting time to be in biomechanics. Our collective knowledge of anatomy and mechanics has been growing for thousands of years. Sensor technologies have been continuously improving for over a hundred years and computing solutions have been developing for a few decades already. 
And even more exciting that is, is that in our lifetime, we are seeing the emergence of a new wave of advancements due to the mobile technology revolution. Micromanufactured wireless sensor and computing technologies are now enabling a whole range of new movement analysis applications outside of the lab that weren't possible before. You can use them um, in the field, in, con in uncontrolled environments, and without needing highly skilled operators. These small mobile sensors also allow for unencumbered natural movement. Now the major advancement uh, that we want to share with you now is how mobile technology is building on all these previous advancements in sensing and computing by seamlessly integrating the entire biomechanics workflow into a single analysis platform. So let's look now how we can use an integrated mobile biomechanics measurement system to answer movement analysis questions. We're going to illustrate this uh, for you using what we call a biomechanics data model. Firstly, when we want to um, use this technology, we need a solid background in the mechanics and physiology of human movement, which is why we touched on these developments earlier. Usually though, we start with a clinical performance or research question. This is a crucial step that shouldn't be rushed through. Um, if our question isn't clear, we won't be able to use our measurement technology very efficiently or effectively. We then uh, develop from our question um, a good experiment or test procedure in order to answer the question. This is also crucial and often underestimated in movement analysis because if the movement task we choose for analysis isn't well suited to answering the question we have, we just won't be able to use our measurement technology very effectively either. So this brings us to the execution of the movement task. Um, traditionally, the most basic movement analysis would simply be a, a visual observation, either with the naked eye or more recently with video. Uh, next, the observations would be interpreted through a specific framework of analysis. So this step is also very important because the analysis is often specific to the movement task and population and it needs to be closely linked with our question in order to provide the real insight we need to answer our question. I'm going to ask Coleman now just to share a little bit with us on the use of video analysis in the biomechanics model that I've just shown you. Thanks John. For each piece of the data model uh, we walked through, we're going to have an applied section that provides a bit of an example around how we can use that data section to gain deeper insight. Before we dive into the case study, let's walk through the background details. We're going to be looking at an elite level female soccer athlete. She's just about to start an off-season training program and the performance staff is running her through uh, an assessment. The performance staff is looking uh, for each athlete's risk of injury, what they really would like to know is what athletes are at risk of sustaining an injury if they participate in our training plan that we've designed. So the, the theory is we know soccer, player, soccer players have many athletic qualities um, and need to have them at a high level to be successful, but one of the most taxing movements uh, is the change of direction which happens to be where most injuries occur in the sport. So to create a test that would give us insight into these changes of directions, we need to reproduce that type of movement, which is a rapid deceleration to a rapid acceleration. Uh, we need to have the body go through something similar during this testing process uh, that can provide us insight into each type of muscle contraction, eccentric, isometric, concentric, uh, which is why we start to look at uh, jumping as a easily operational and very insightful movement pattern that can give us this, the components that we're looking for. 
So this background detail exactly follows our data model by understanding the, the question, uh, understanding uh, our human movement theory, uh, designing the experiment, and selecting a movement to analyze. And it really primes us for data recording, analysis, and a final insight. But as John pointed out, it all starts with visual observation. And I happen to have a sample video here. Uh, so let's see what we can uh, identify just using visual observation. So there it is. So is the athlete at risk of injury? Very hard to tell, right? This, this is what researchers, educational or applied, had to use until the 1800s to identify uh, the compensatory movement patterns of an athlete. Um, this, is, this takes years and years of practice to really hone uh, what people call the coaching eye. But the problem with just using visual observation is you only have one chance to see the movement. You're, it's only one perspective and at one speed, real time. It's much more difficult to see the subtle details of the movement, uh, which are very telling of an athlete's ability. Uh, with the invention of video, we're able to address all of these issues. And here's an example of how those issues can be resolved. So as you can see, from a recorded video, you can start to s slow the video down, have multiple perspectives, and loop the video to review uh, the, moment, the movement as many times as you need. Uh, as you look at the slower frame rate, uh, on the right, it's a bit choppy, uh, but you can still see a few things. We can see the depth of her squat. We can see how her hands start to come off her hips during the loading phase of the jump and how she's translating forward um, from the beginning to end of her jump. Overall, nothing looks out of the ordinary from that sagittal view. Let's take a look at the high-speed video, which is going to be on the left. Now you can see a bit more detail around the quality of the jump. We switched perspectives, and we were able to slow it down. Uh, we can see a lot of variability in that hip internal external rotation at the end of the eccentric phase, so the bottom of that squat and the beginning of the concentric phase. Uh, there's also a bit of weight shift to the athlete's left leg, which gives us a hint about a kinematic asymmetry that we may run into. Um, so this seems great. We have a, a few insights around the athlete. Um, so what's the problem? Why can't we use this to to assess completely. Um, the problem is we're only, we're only seeing two-dimensional data, and as we know as practitioners, the body moves in three dimensions. Bones and muscles act in all three dimensions. Uh, there's an assumption that the camera is perfectly perpendicular to the, to the, the plane that we're, we're interested in, which is a, a very large assumption. Uh, a shift in centimeters can mean a drastic uh, perceived ang angle change, which is um, not very reliable and can skew your prescription uh, accordingly. So from that aspect, there's a few reliability alarms going off, uh, and review of these videos have given more questions to answer. Questions like, what are the real anatomical angles? Uh, is the variability we're seeing in the knee coming from a hip mobility stability problem or an ankle mobility stability problem? Uh, what's the actual asymmetry that we're seeing? Is that acceptable? Uh, are there better measures of motion that we could use to answer all of these questions? And with the next portion of our data model, John's going to walk us through um, different techniques that could help us answer these questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Coleman. So, yes, video analysis does remain a cornerstone of applied 
biomechanics. But to get more accurate and detailed information, we really need to turn to measurement technologies with a higher temporal and spatial resolution. And the next level of movement tracking after video analysis is 3D motion capture technology. So like video, motion capture involves the tracking of points on the external surface of the body. We can call this segmental kinematics. Now, motion capture systems provide incredibly detailed and useful information, but it's important for us to spend time becoming familiar with their strengths and weaknesses. The most two popular modalities are optical motion capture systems, which use cameras to track um, the segmental kinematics, and inertial motion capture systems, which use accelerometers, gyroscopes, and magnetometers. So inertial sensor units, sometimes called IMUs, are small wireless devices that uh, form part of the mobile revolution in biomechanics that we're talking about today. Now segment kinematics um, includes linear or angular data, and which, which is useful on its own. For example, when you want to track non-anatomical metrics such as the height of a point on the body above the floor or foot speed during a kicking movement. But just like the artists and physicians during the Renaissance, we often want to see inside the body to gain a deeper insight into the skeletal kinematics. Except we don't want to do dissection, we want to be able to do it during a functional movement and we want to do it non-invasively. So because we can't measure functional movement of the skeleton directly with sensors, uh, we typically have to estimate these using the external measurements or the segmental kinematics and computational modeling techniques. So this means that we need additional information about the subject to create a digital representation or model of their musculoskeletal system. And this model needs to be scaled to their body size, either using imaging data or anthropometric measurements, and then it needs to be mapped geometrically to the coordinate systems used to express the segmental kinematics. So essentially what I'm saying is we need to calibrate this model to the subject um, and to the sensor modality that we're using so that we can reliably recreate the, the movement digitally and reliably extract the angulation and translation of the skeletal bones in our model. So in summary, it's crucial when you do experiments using 3D motion capture systems that you have an understanding of the process producing your measured data and your modeling data. So I'm going to ask uh, Coleman if he can tell us a little bit more about the value of IMU motion capture technology and the value it can add to our jump analysis. Okay, thanks John. As John mentioned, 2D market tracking uh, on videos like we just reviewed uh, is going to be good for quick investigations but not ideal for a decision-making process or decision-driving investigation. Uh, this is where IMUs come in, which is what we're going to use during this example because uh, IMUs as well as other marker-based motion capture uh, like Vicon are extremely powerful in collecting kinematic data. Uh, with these sensors we can gather accelerations and rotations of individual segments, which this would be an example of, that raw data coming in. Uh, as you can see, we can collect a very large amount of uh, accurate IMU data, but until we apply it uh, to a model, it's really hard for us to quickly leverage and understand that, that information, uh, especially to answer the questions that we that we have. So let's model it by taking the data and applying it, the orientations and rotations to an anatomical model that will allow us to get the anatomical angles changes uh, at each joint. And this is an example of what that looks like. You can see we have the anatomical angles calculated um, and presented as data streams, which will be on the, the left. Those three uh, are the hip, abduction, rotation, and flexion. And then we can add a bit of 
uh, visualization to this data and we can see how those values are starting to um, act on the body with this 3D avatar. So with this, with this visualization, we can start to add visibility. We can, we can start to see the values that support what our intuition has told us when we review the video. Uh, in the video playback, we're able to see variability in the knee. Uh, we know that the knee is at the mercy of both the hip and the ankle. So we must, so we must look into both during this kinematic analysis. If we look at the point of peak hip flexion, which would be at the bottom of the squat, we can get kinematic char characteristics of the hip um, to provide us that understanding that we're seeking. Um, so we will, we're going we're gonna to pause the recording at the point of peak hip flexion, and just to rule it out, we're going to start with the, the ankle. And the values at the ankle show a 2.7 degree difference favoring the left side uh, when, we're, when we're looking at ankle dorsiflexion. When we're looking at ankle eversion, we see a 3 degree difference favoring the left side. These are both within an acceptable range, telling us there's not really a mobility issue here, um, which, we, which we were able to visualize from the previous videos. Um, now let's look at the hip. So the hip has a hip flexion asymmetry of 2.4 degrees, a hip abduction asymmetry of 12 degrees, more on the right side, and a hip rotation asymmetry of 18 degrees. Uh, the right femur is actually internally rotated, which is a very compromising position. So in reviewing those numbers, hip flexion seems within a reasonable range and, uh, and symmetric but there's something jumping out around hip abduction and hip rotation. Uh, these values tell us the athlete's doing something to gain mobility in the hip at the, the depth of the squat by compromising her other mechanical characteristics, potentially by pivoting the hip or actually rotating this, the femoral segment. This IMU data is, is much more detailed than what we're able to get from uh, a visual observation of video, as it does not allow for very, ac very accurate cor collection of rotation or 3D movement, um, which would have been missed that we were able to gain from these IMUs. Um, where, where we were able to answer our questions, um, we now have an additional additional questions kind of come to mind around how this is actually resulting in the output of that movement, which would be the force production and strength characteristics. It seems like she's protecting her right side. Uh, does that change the actual load asymmetry? Does the pelvic shift and jump technique change how she's actually uh, loading her body? Is it different in the concentric or eccentric phase of this jump, which is important if we're looking at uh, a change of direction, which has both components to it? So even though we were able to answer a lot of questions about uh, kinematics, the kinetics are something that uh, is, again, going to give us a deeper understanding of what is happening within this athlete. Um, so John uh, will walk through this in the next piece of the data model uh, and help us answer these questions. Great. So as Coleman said, uh, once we have performed a kinematic analysis, we, we might want to dig deeper and investigate the underlying causes of the movement pattern that we're observing. And uh, as we know from Newton's laws of motion, movement is the result of forces. So. Again, we start with the external forces that we can measure non-invasively. We can call these the segmental kinetics. And the most important of these is the contact forces acting on the body segments, usually the ground reaction forces acting on the feet. 
So this is typically done using a 3D force platform which can register the magnitude and direction of the ground reaction force as well as its position on the plate surface. So if you have uh, wanting to measure ground reaction forces on each foot, you just need two plates. Now the force plate data is a, a composite metric which helps us to relate the overall movement of the body's center of mass to the net force acting on the body and being produced by the body. Just as with the kinematics, we usually want to look inside the body rather than just on the outside of the body in order to understand, in this case, the internal skeletal kinetics. And this can be done using um, the skeletal kinematics that we've measured and segmental kinetics data that we're measuring now with the force plate together in an inverse dynamics modeling scheme. So estimates of the skeletal kinetics help us to understand how the loading of the subject's weight is distributed between the different joints in the body and also how different joints contribute power towards shaping the movement pattern. So Coleman uh, can now go and give us an example of how uh, this can be used in our jump analysis. Thanks, John. With externally measured forces, we can start to get a better understanding around the outcome of a movement or the way the athlete expresses force through movement. Uh, if we include force into our system, we can start to see the difference between the left and right force production, which I have a video here. Now, just from the raw data, which we can see on the left side, we can't infer too much. Uh, what we can do is visualize that data over the video, which you can see the two vectors coming out of the force plates on the uh, two videos on the right. Uh, we call this force vector overlay. And as we step through this video, we can start to see the kinetic differences between the left and right side. We can quickly see that athlete is favoring the left side, most likely protecting the right. With a, with a quick analysis of these values, we can calculate a few variables that will give us insight into the, how much the athlete uh, is favoring and what they're doing kinetically. So with this table, we can start to under, understand how she's modifying her loading and landing patterns in a way that's creating asymmetry. And we calculated four variables, the kinetic asymmetry index, which is the amount of force uh, during, a, during the eccentric and concentric loading phase um, compared, comparing the left and right side, all boiled down into a ratio. Um, so the impulse during the eccentric phase, left and right comparison, uh, was 2.6, so really favoring that left side. In the concentric phase, it was 2.2, a little less, but still favoring that left side. Um, there is peak force values where we saw pretty symmetric peaks, um, only a, just a 5% and a 6% difference um, during the loading and landing phase, respectively. Uh, and then the rate of force development, so how much and this athlete can actually load her muscles um, actively to produce that, that velocity and the force uh, to propel them up into the air. Uh, this was a 25% difference or a ratio of 1.25, which is um, fairly significant. Um, so this kind of confirms what we saw kinematically with the kinetic data, so completely objectively, it uh, allows us to confirm what we saw uh, kinematically. So this is great to understand, but I'm still not sure if the difference in loading is caused by a technique issue or a, or a muscle dominance or overactivation uh, issue, which overactivation could be the result of a 
pain or an impingement that, that the athlete is hiding. And athletes are typically not only the best competitors, but the best compensators. So they're very good at hiding uh, these underlying uh, root causes. So in this next portion, John's going to help us address these questions of whether it's technique or, or dominance or overactivation uh, characteristics of the movement pattern that are that are causing this asymmetry. And that next piece of the data model will help us answer those questions. Okay, thanks Coleman. So the measurement of movement and the underlying forces covers the mechanical aspects of the movement. And this is really the perspective which appeals to those of us who have a background in the natural sciences. It's the engineer's approach of treating the body like a machine and applying formulas and mechanical laws to the study of it. But of course we know from as early back as Galen and the anatomists of the Renaissance that movement has its roots not in mechanics but in physiological or more specifically neuromuscular activity. And this is the contrasting perspective on movement analysis which appeals to those of us who have a background in the biological sciences. Now back to Coleman's question, we can, we can use surface EMG as mentioned earlier to measure the neural excitation signal sent from the brain to the muscles near the surface of the skin. And we can call this muscle excitation. And as with the force and movement measurements, this is an external measure related to the internal neuromuscular activity. Now, um, EMG is useful for giving us an indication of the changes in excitation during a task, like the jump that we're looking at, and how these changes relate to the mechanics that we're observing. And they're also, EMG is also very useful for sometimes perhaps not in this case, getting an indication of muscle fatigue, as well as the intensity of, or the relative intensity of neural excitations. Now with surface EMG, we aren't able to directly see into a specific muscle and gauge its contribution to the skeletal kinetics. However, we can use some advanced muscle modeling methods again, just like we did in the mechanics, to see inside the body and to estimate the, the individual muscle contraction times and muscle forces. Now Coleman's going to um, tell us a little bit more about how we can use EMG to gain insight in our, into our jump test athlete. Thanks John. Uh, to answer the previous question on whether there's a technique or dominance issue within this female athlete, we're going to use EMG to help us find the answer. In this example of the athlete has EMG sensors on her calf, hamstring, and quad. So medial gastroc, semitendinosus, and vastus medialis. Uh, let's focus on the right side, uh, as this is where a uh, majority of the asymmetry is coming from. Let's, let's start with technique. I have a video of the EMG for us to review as we go through this. Uh, when we're looking at the athlete's jump technique from a muscle firing standpoint, we're looking for the muscles to fire in a proximal to distal manner. You know, from a timing analysis of this data, uh, EMG is going to be on the left-hand side. Uh, we're going to see that the firing order uh, of hamstrings, quads, calves fits what our understanding of the kinetic sequencing um, that's required for an efficient movement or efficient, efficient jump um, really aligns with the way that this athlete's uh, performing her movement. So that helps us rule out jump technique as a root cause for what we're seeing. So let's look at dominance or overstimulation. To do this, we want to look at a phase where we have co-contractions spe specifically between the quads and hamstrings. Again, I want to point out in a change of direction movement, the eccentric phase of the task is where most non-contact non injuries occur. With that in mind, let's look at the landing phase of the jump and see the relative activation levels, which we can get from our EMG data set. 
what we see is evidence supporting the uh, a bit of quad dominance, which happens to be common among female athletes. Uh, during change of direction, research, research has traditionally shown athletes, specifically females, that are quad dominant have a higher risk of suffering a non-contact injury. So we see here in this table that uh, there's a two to one percent activate or twice as much activation in the quads as there is hamstrings. The quads being at 122 percent and the hamstrings being at 55 percent uh, relative max contraction. So just to elaborate on you know why this is important, the quad hamstring ratio, um, the activation of the hamstring actually is a protective force act that acts on the femur, um, which reduces the stress acting on the ACL, preventing that femur from translating through the knee or anteriorly through the knee. Uh, this is why the, that ratio is important for, for considering when you're trying to protect those young athletes or clients. Uh, this is this is great insights. We we have kind of this root cause of you know where the where the issue is stemming from, um, but there's still now one question left in my mind is why is this data so segmented and how can I go about integrating these findings into a clearer picture to save time and produce faster results? And John's going to complete our data model. Uh, in this next section. Okay, so as we saw earlier with the historical development of biomechanics, the field is really multidisciplinary. It's an integration of a, a mathematical, mechanical perspective of motion and a biological or physiological perspective on human movement. And it's really this integration that I want to focus on now. So. Most of us have a background in or are more comfortable in one of these two streams, but if we can learn to see human movement from both of these perspectives, um, we'll have an integrated perspective and be able to think more clearly through the relationships between the different types of data in this data model that we're analyzing now for the jump. And as we've said earlier, um, besides the fundamental knowledge, really technology is where we add um, value to movement analysis and we've shown how mobile technology has really revolutionized the sensor solutions that were made that were made available to us during the industrial revolution and this is opening up new movement analysis applications which Coleman is still going to touch on but as we've seen in the um, in the case study with Coleman the integrative um, approach is not only in the knowledge domain, not only in the sense domain, but also in the computing um, solutions for mobile wearable biomechanical sensor technologies. And these computing solutions are evolving and um, remain a very active area of research and development today. Um, re regarding our um, modeling data that we discussed, it's just important to note that with the current state of the art in mobile biomechanics, it's still not possible to fully uh, provide a reliable modeling of skeletal kinetics and muscular forces. You'll notice I just grayed out those boxes now, the green boxes at the bottom of the data model. Um, and these are simply limitations that are being worked on um, and hopefully will be addressed in the near future. But this is why we didn't provide any muscle force modeling or skeletal kinetics modeling um, using the IMU technology in this example. But I just wanted to highlight that we're on this journey um, in mobile biomechanics to really produce a full biomechanical data model. And so it's a subject of a lot of research and development. Um, lastly, just a comment is to say that besides the modeling solutions which are being worked on today in research, there's also significant interest in the analytical tools. Um, that we can use to gain insights more quickly and more effectively. And these are particularly um, in the machine learning type of algorithms and artificial intelligence approaches that are emerging today. 
and these really help with dealing with large volumes of measurement and modeling data which are coming from these systems and ensure and, and the goal is really to ensure that we do get the insight out of these large data sets. But for now, Coleman's just going to quickly highlight the cutting edge today in mobile biomechanics technology and in some of the more exciting applications that we can now explore. Thanks, John. Now, this is why John and I are both so excited to be in such a cutting edge field is that there's no longer the need to spend years and years on a single analysis like they used to do, but rather we have all the data at our fingertips uh, to help utilize and improve our effective, effectiveness as practitioners. And this is an example of everything we walked through today within one data file. And there's softwares like these that now take all those technical problems that traditional biomechanics labs ran into, like interfacing current and future technologies, syncing the data sets, playing back all the data sets in, while they're in sync, processing each individual channel, and analyzing all the data types. Um, this typically happened in multiple systems, and you know these softwares that bring them all under one roof make these traditional problems as easy as a button click. All your data uh, in one file, easy to process, and more importantly, answer questions with. Uh, this, this allows us to start to reduce the time you spend on the computer digging through data and replace it with more time facilitating positive change within the people that depend on you or you're trying to impact just like the soccer player. So uh, we're going to, just to wrap up the soccer player case study that we've been going through, um, within one data set we're able to work from visual observation to 3D kinematics, which led us to investigate her kinetics and finally understand her underlying neuromuscular movement strategies or tendencies. Uh, from the video, we were able to see a lateral shift and some knee deviation from the 3D motion data, the IMUs. We were able to understand her range of motion and those kinematic asymmetries. When we worked through the force section, uh, we could understand how she's a producing force eccentrically and concentrically during the jump. And lastly, within the EMG data sets, we were able to understand uh, timing and, quad, and actually understand the if there was any dominance issues, which we saw there was a quad dominance issue. Uh, <clears throat> this is the information I would take back to the performance team that initially asked the question, and you know I would use I would I would use it and and walk them through it just just in the same way I did with with all of us on the on the webinar to consider changing or adjusting the off-season training program to fit this athlete. So I would modify the off to, to wrap it up, I would modify the off-season training plan uh, and have a customized plan for this athlete that included uh, posterior chain strengthening with deadlifts and squats, unilateral strength and strength and power components built in uh, as a complementary lift or multi multi-directional change of direction training during a movement session or plyometrics built into uh, both the power portion of the movement and, and strength sessions that this athlete would go through in the postseason or off-season training program. Above all, this is an assessment and I would want the athlete to go into an into a deeper examination by the, the physical therapy staff to complement and add to the changes that I would suggest within the training program. Um, you know, with this simple two-minute examination or two-minute assessment, we were able to gain a lot of insight into the underlying nuances of the athlete's movement. And 
to use that as a flag to send to deeper investigations through a physical therapist, uh, a physical therapist or um, doctor is only going to strengthen um, the quality of the plan tailored to that athlete. So with all this complex data, we were able to boil it down into one data set, com completely analyze it, and provide that feedback back to the people that are going to be uh, implementing a program around this athlete, which is great. And that's just one application. As we, as we move into this next section, it's going to kind of break down each one of the applications the data model can be applied to and really start to speak to your creativity as a practitioner and, and, and let you understand what the potential capabilities of this new cutting edge technology uh, can do for you. So in this section, we're going to work on or we're going to walk through the different applications of our data model. Uh, this is to further highlight the utility of all these new mobile biomechanics sensing technologies. Uh, I, I just want to help, help quickly paint the picture of how these can you know, help you as a practitioner to streamline your process, move towards objective data, um, to help provide critical insight for your decision making process. So <clears throat> in general, all of this data uh, and the applications can be broken down into four different buckets. Uh, these, these different buckets cover about 90% of uh, what we see the applications of, of the data being. And it, <clears throat> just like we went through, it starts with the assessment, which is a quick way to identify the individual's current capabilities, compensatory movement patterns, risk of injury, and underlying conditions. And uh, this, as you saw, can be very powerful when you are have no history with the individual. Um, and it's something that's typically done in the clinic, like a PT clinic or an outpatient facility. Um, and the current industry standard is very subjective, so this data can start to you know, kind of complement the efforts that are already going on. Uh, monitoring is our second bucket, which is collecting data uh, at a consistent rate to provide you as clinicians with a much clearer picture on how an individual is responding to your treatment or your training plan. So this is, a, this is interesting because you can begin to optimize your treatments and training plans based off of this historical data that's coming in uh, real time from your from your patients or athletes. Uh, the next section is biofeedback using biomechanics as a as a training tool. So real time feedback uh, from <clears throat> or visualization of any of these waveforms that we work through uh, is called biofeedback. And this allows for an athlete or an individual to immediately connect and experiment um, their other senses like visual, auditory, and tactile sensing uh, to increase that connection to what you're trying to have them do uh, through a different, through a specific task. Uh, finally, the last bucket is really exciting because it's performance and it's uh, the outcome data of all the work that they've been doing as athletes or patients, and it. With this mo new mobile technology, there are very few environments that are off limits to collect data now. And this allows us to understand objectively what an athlete's going through during the uncontrolled, chaotic environment that we call sport or competition. So just to dive a bit deeper, uh, <clears throat> our data model was broken down into Different, different data types and you know as we apply those data types as practitioners we look at them in a, a bit different perspective. We, we look at forces as giving us insight into the ability to express control, stabilize internal or external loads on the body. Uh, motion we, we look at 
through the lens of providing us with joint mobility and stability um, metrics during static and dynamic movements. And neural activation provides us with insight into muscular effort or coordination or symmetry, um, <clears throat> which is a bit different, like I said, from the traditional researcher's perspective. It's more uh, gaining insight and up applying our, our concept of human movement to the data types. So when we look at a assessment, again, this is a baseline. This is a way to rapidly uh, gain insight into uh, the key qualities or capabilities that you're interested in as a practitioner. And really what it's doing is removing the bias and, and confirming your intuition as a practitioner for, uh, for you to objectively measure and, and make decisions around uh, the athlete's current capabilities. And one application of this is a running assessment. So here we're using you know, a similar data set to uh, begin to analyze this individual's gait. And within this assessment, you know, we can start to narrow down what we're looking at. Um, within the, the kinetic bucket of data, we are looking at center of pressure traces, tibial shock, um, motion. We're looking at stability and mobility issues like hip drop, hip and knee adduction hip and knee rotations. Uh, neuromuscularly, we're looking at prime mover activation level and core activation or fatigue during this assessment. And once we have all that information, uh, we begin to intervene, right? We begin to train and, <clears throat> and work with the individuals. And a great way to speed up that process is through biofeedback. And biofeedback is again, tapping into all of our senses to really uh, accelerate that learning curve. And it, it, provides us, it provides us with a way to gain greater awareness on many physiological functions, primarily using instruments that provide information um, directly back to the, the client uh, with, the, with the goal being uh, able for that client to manipulate those signals to achieve what you're asking them to. And I have a few examples of what that looks like. In this example, we can provide this video playback to the athlete and say there's a bit of knee valgus happening and uh, speak to that moment arm that's acting on the knee as being a uh, dangerous risk of injury uh, that we can work with them on and use as a, as a feedback mechanism for them to train around. Additionally, here's another example. Uh, this individual has some weakness on that left side. You can see he's reviewing the computer and trying to reach a certain level of uh, hit or knee, ex knee extension. And we'll play that one more time. You can see he's fine on the, re the right side, but as he watches uh, his signal on the, on the left side and that degree of flexion, you can see him instantly over three reps get to the, the range that the physical therapist is looking for. So that's how quickly uh, biofeedback can really work to influence your uh, training as a practitioner and and it's very good for adherence, it's very good for motivation, it provides a some feedback around a task rather than just providing them with an exercise and giving them reps to uh, complete. So um, we can get into the neuroscience in a different webinar but uh, this has been shown to drastically improve outcome. And once, once this is integrated, it's an easy transition into monitoring because we can consistently and 
<clears throat> consistently measure meaningful data over time. And collecting that data uh, allows us to understand uh, the, the adaptations that are going on within the individual and continue to push them and progress them um, accordingly or regress them if we, if we aren't seeing the results that uh, are where we want them to be. And this can continue on and continue on <clears throat> until the athlete is back to a place where they're ready to perform whether, and whatever performance means to that individual. It could mean <clears throat> uh, on, the, on the ski slopes, as we see here, we now have the ability to take this technology and monitor them in that environment. And you know, performance can it can mean <clears throat> athletics, or it could mean being able to, you know, walk with my kids after work, or walk up the stairs, or uh, not have pain throughout the day. All of these things can be monitored and provided back to the individual, um, <clears throat> because now this data is coming to us in this portable this portable acquisition system, it allows for, you know, this to happen at in any environment. And skiing is one environment. Uh, it could be up on stage uh, as a performer in the ballet. And, you know, it's really up to us as researchers, us as practitioners to uh, apply these concepts in this data acquisition to uh, the environments that we see as interesting. And uh, these are just a few brief examples that, you know, can kind of get your mind uh, in that creative state to understand what would be exciting for you. And really that's what we're here to do is to have a conversation around <clears throat> what is, you know, a, a new area that, that hasn't been able to be, be reached before and how can we help get you there. And uh, we we're really excited and really interested in seeing, you know, what the world comes up with and, and are definitely here to help. Um, and we just want to say, you know, thank you for spending the time and listening to, to us uh, go through our concept of biomechanics data and how it can be applied to the, the real world scenarios in this untethered fashion. And uh, with that, uh, thank you so much for listening. We're going to go through a brief Q&A session. Um, so I'll hand hand over the controls back to Martin. And, uh, you know, from John and I, thanks again for so much for, for sticking with us and listening. There was some mention, and obviously there was that slide presented, Coleman, about the uh, software platform that integrates the native and external hardware. I guess that's the MR3. So... The question is, is is this a workaround or is it really a true integration of all the signals? And, you know, based on your experience working in a lab, how would you answer that question? I would say that uh, MR3 is actually a true integration of all of these data sources. Um, they, the platform that we use, MR3, you know, brings in and seamlessly syncs all of these unique systems into one platform. So uh, all of the reliability and technical pieces that you would do in a um, to your data set to bring everything together as a researcher through MATLAB or LabVIEW or whatever you would use uh, is built into this software and it, it truly gives you that one data set that you can analyze. I would just add that it's not a work, it's not an, um, an offline um, solution. You can really um, capture this data and stream it in real time. So it's not that you're integrating these data sets into the software after the fact. It's actually streaming and collecting into the platform at the same time. So, and it's a, a full-on um, integration, time synchronization, everything is happening in the software. So uh, I don't know exactly what is meant by uh, um, I don't know what the term was, um, working uh, around, but uh, work I around. think, yeah, but I, 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 I don't think, no, it's definitely not a workaround, it's a, I mean, these solutions are basically ready to go um, 
and work under you know you can you can test it and it will it will ha handle like a large amount of data collection or processing um, it's not something that's just got stuck together <laughs> okay perfect um, so thanks for that answer uh, Coleman during your your slide presentation about IMUs um, you know, a few questions came in about how one calibrates an IMU and uh, the resolution of the measurement and you know confidence in measurements of you know say between two to three degrees can you just provide in general you know in a general sense uh, how one would go about that process of calibrating and ensure that that there's confidence in the data that's being reported yeah John John do you want to take can, that one I, yeah I'll, I'll jump in there so um, Depending on what, there are different types of calibrations. The the IMUs that you would buy would be factory calibrated and would be ready to go in terms of measuring their own motion. So when we talked in the data model about segmental kinematics, you're literally um, just sticking the sensor on and it's able to track its own motion well within um, three degrees accuracy, probably quite a lot lower than that. Um, so the, the, the accuracy of these IMUs is actually uh, really good uh, after quite a couple of years of development in the field. So you can expect an I, a higher grade IMU uh, to give you accuracies uh, within two degrees, um, even better in many cases. Um, the only time when you can expect uh, difficulties measuring with an IMU is in a magnetically um, disturbed environment just due to the fact of the way the sensor measures its own movement. And then in terms of calibration really, um, uh, besides the factory calibration of the sensor, you are, it's necessary to calibrate this IMU relative to the body. And so uh, with IMU technology there are different ways of doing this. Some of them involve a person standing in a specific pose and in other cases you can uh, make them do specific movements so that you can find where the bones are relative to the IMU. So that would be the model calibration. Um, okay. I think for these tests they were done with a static calibration. Static excellent. Pose. Okay, excellent. Um, again, just looking at the time and being sensitive to the fact that uh, we are running over, I, I may just ask one or, or two more questions. This is a very, you know, general question, perhaps, and um, you know, I don't know how easy it is to answer it. But you know, I'll, 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 I'll ask it, and then I'll let either of you jump in. But you know, based on what you were showing today, um, you know, all the great data, the videos, and the IMU data, and, and EMG, how do you determine, or how do you know what is actionable data in your analysis? Is it, um, is it just Ooh. a matter of knowing what's normal and and um, where there there is uh, you know something to be to yeah. address or, or correct. I think that's a sorry, John. I'll I'll start yeah, and maybe you can add yeah. to. Um, I think that this is a perfect question to really highlight uh, the the beauty of this biomechanics data model we have, and um, you know there needs to be a foundational knowledge of uh, human movement theory or theory around uh, what. Uh, what you need to be looking for um, as a foundation, but then also understand the constraints of, of the population that you're using. And um, that is kind of uh, this gray space between the applied world and the, the fundamental researcher world because the fundamental researchers, are like John, are, are, are looking into these subtle nuances that can potentially influence the way that somebody is prescribing or training or or recommending um, to an athlete, uh, so it's it's kind of this blend of being current with your and always building insight and a, evolving your your theory around how people move and and what's important, to, uh, especially within different environments and 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 in this case sport. And I, I really think that it's a tough question, but it, it it highlights exactly what we're talking about. Is you know we need you need to start you need to start somewhere, and you're continually going to add and evolve to the way you think about things. 
Okay, well, excellent. Yeah, John, anything to add to that? Just very briefly, I mean, it's a good answer. I'd, I would just say that um, from a theoretical perspective, you know, there are different ways of looking at how to compare the data that you're measuring to some sort of standard or reference. And um, if you're trying to assess someone to understand if there's some sort of uh, problematic aspect of the movement, then um, traditionally we've compared them to some sort of normative data set, particularly in gait analysis and the more um, established fields of motion capture. Um, but there's also changes now in the field where people are starting to look at each person as an individual and particularly um, focusing on the fact that although we're all moving similarly, we all actually um, have differences that affect how we move. And so um, it's really important to also dig deep into the literature and understand, um, as the question points out, what is uh, the, the, the direction we're trying to take the person if we're intervening? And um, if we're diagnosing, really, are we confident about the markers that we're looking for in data? So this is, again, movement-specific, uh, uh, disease-specific, and so on. But um, yeah, I think it's either going to be a normative type of uh, data set for a group, but the more modern approach is really to use people as their own control and test them multiple times and see the progression and see if you can improve them in, in some way that you've decided is a, is a good direction to take them in.